uh, tonight we're going to talk about a continuation of the last theme. I should say the last word in verse 21 of chapter 5. Be subjective. Be subjective or submission, right? So if anybody feels led to read for the group, Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 33, we'll see what the Holy Spirit would help us to learn. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Thank you, Frank. So these verses can be summed up in four words can be summed up with four words. Word number one, mandate, mandate. Paul is going to begin with giving a mandate to the wives and then to the husband. The second word will be motives. What is Paul's motives in giving the mandate to the wives and then to the husband? And then Paul is going to tie the mandate and the motives to the mystery, to the mystery. And you're going to see this passage is really not about gender roles or differences or what have you. And lastly, he's going to encapsulate his teaching with a memorandum, memorandum to the wives and to the husband. So the first three chapters of Ephesians, as with most, if not all, of Paul's writings are theology. You can sum up the first three chapters of Ephesians when it comes to his theology simply in two words, new identity. You and I, when we become a Christian, we have a new identity. The identity is we are children of God, children of the light. We are disciples. We are the mystery that God gave Paul, uh, not to the other apostle, is that you are members of this body of Christ. So that's very important. Coming to 4, 5, and 6, as with all of his writings, he gives us the applications of the theology of the new identity. That's why beginning with chapter 4, he's talking a lot about walking. Walking in wisdom, walking in love, walking in humility. And he ends that walk with last Monday's discussion. In verse 21, he shifted his thinking process by using this word to be in subjection or submission in all other English translation. From now on, he's going to give us three distinct examples of submission. The first one is in the context of a marriage, wives to the husbands. The second one, children to the parents in chapter six. The third one, slaves to the master. So the big idea that we're gonna begin to unpack tonight is this word subjection or submission. 
It's very interesting that he begins with the wives. He begins by giving the command to the wife. Notice it says right here, wives, be subject to your own husband. The one English word own is very important. What is Paul trying to tell you and I right here, especially if you are the wife living in the context of marriage as the wife? You, uh, biblically speaking, according to Paul, are only to subject yourself to your husbands. Is this clear? This word on is very important. Paul is not downplaying the rights of the wives. In fact, as we finish tonight, you're going to see Paul in this writing and teaching is actually pro-wives instead of pro-husbands, as has been conventionally interpreted, as has been conventionally interpreted. Uh, if you got the note, it will be very helpful for us to focus on the chiastic structure of these verses. That's the best way to interpret this passage. If you interpret this passage according to the chiasm, that chiastic structure, chiasm is a literary technique used by a lot of the authors of the Bible. It is arranging their thoughts sequentially to form the letter X to in the middle of that form of the sequence will be the main thought, will be the meat, if you want to put it that way, of his writing. And then he would trace it backward. And if you follow that chiastic structure, for example, right, uh, we're going to zoom in, right, from this chiastic structure to the main thought. What is the main thought according to the chiastic structure regarding this passage? Mission. Present ourselves to the church in all our glory. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the main meat. That's the main thought. Now, if you just take away all the other verses, if you just zoom in on the letter X, who do you think Paul is pro in his teaching? We're the wife. Oh, the chromosomes. The X and Y chromosome. <laughs> no? No, no, not right? <laughs> very, 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 very nice. Praise, thing, Mary. praise <laughs> on the cross, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the letter A, B, C, D, E is just to sequentially line up his thoughts, right? So the main thought behind this le letter X, it may seem in the beginning that he's focusing on the pronoun he, Right, that he might present himself the church in all her glory. But the, the, the main thought in this Acts statement is actually Christ presenting the bride, his bride, the church, in all her glory. The qualifying phrase is very important. For that reason, Paul begins this teaching by giving the mandates to the wife. Notice it says in 22, be subject to your own husband as to the Lord. The reason he qualifies that subjection of the wife to the husband as to the Lord, we got to go back to the prior verse. What is the main thought of the prior verse, 21? When it comes to subjection or submission, who submits to who? Subject to one another. One another. One subjects to the other. In this case, he begins with the wise. Why? Later on, he's going to tell us. Because just as Christ is the head of the church, so is the wives have been created out of a side of the husband. He's going to take our memory all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 in the creation of Adam and Eve where God took a side of Adam and then created Eve and then brought Eve to Adam. And because of that, Eve will always be a part and parcel of Adam. It does not necessarily mean that Eve is inferior to Adam. This is not about a gender role. 
This is not about the differences of the gender role. This is not a spotlighting of the inferiority of the wives, of the women. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Now, this, this work in 23, for, because the husband is the head of the wife. This word head, if you have to know, it actually means first, only. It does not mean having more authority or power over. It means the first, prominence, priority, only. This is very important for us to understand. This word head, kepale, has been misinterpreted by so many that are uh, narcissistic, if you want to put it that way. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, your pastor might appear to you to be a holy man of God. But when it comes to narcissism, that will play out in his relationship to his wife. He's not going to show it to you on the pulpit, but his narcissism will show up in a private relationship to his wife and with his wife, with whom she lives, 724. So we have to understand this word head, not in the sense of overruling, not in the sense of overstepping. It simply means because the husband, Adam, is prominent first. Only going back to the creation of Adam and Eve. Who did God create first? Adam. Right? See, this is very important. This is why this, this passage has caused so much controversy. This is why most Christian wives, when they come to a Bible study with their husband, and the passage is Ephesians 5, 22, 33, if they are honest, they're going to say, I cringe. This is why. Misinterpretation of this word head. Bill? Well, Good? Yeah. Yeah. This is very important for us to get this right, right here, right? So, because the husband is the prominent one, the husband is the beginning, the husband is the origin, if you want to put it that way, of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. Here is the important part that he flushed out in the following verses. Christ himself being the savior of the body. Right there is telling you, he's not talking about roles and responsibility of husbands and wives in the marriage. He's not talking at all about who is over who, who is in charge over who. Don't forget this I hear in verse 23. He himself being the savior of the body. Most people, when they process this passage, they take this out. And therefore, the interpretation is flawed. And it causes a lot of heartache and headaches for married couple. So far, so good. <laughs> Bill, can you explain that, Paul, a little? The uh, verse twenty-three, like tie yeah. it all together, right to he himself being the savior of the body. Yeah, uh, if you if you go back to the chiastic structure of this verses, if we just focus on the statement next to that letter X. Yeah. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory. That's how Christ is going to save the body. That's how Christ is going to save you and I. You and I, according to the Bible, every one of us was born a sinner. And every one of us, no matter how hard we try to obey God, no matter how much we go through the sanctification process, in verse uh, 27, he's going to mention two key words, wrinkles and spots. You and I, as long as we live in this world, you and I are going to have wrinkles and spots that only the Holy Spirit can turn them around into holiness and blamelessness. That's the job of the Holy Spirit that has been given to you and I as members of Christ's body, the church. For that reason, it says in verse 23, 
Christ himself is the savior of the body. How is he going to save you and I? Washing the spots and wrinkles with his word to where we will no longer have spots and wrinkle, but we will be found by our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, holy and blameless. For that reason, the main thought of this passage is for Christ to present his bride, you and I, the church, in all our glory, minus the spots, minus the wrinkles. Does it help, Bill? This qualifying truth in verse 23, this is the, the, the truth of this whole passage. Paul is not telling the husband to be the head. Paul is not telling the husband to overrule the wife. Paul is not favoring the husband. In fact, if you process this verse 23 based on what I've just shared with you, the man, the husband, have been put by Paul from the get-go of this teaching to be under the gun. Mm -hmm. Let's flesh this out in practicality, shall we, Stephen? So you say that the scars and the wrink are the, the the stains and the wrinkles, but does that leave scars? And I, I the reason I say that the scars there is that to look back and see the memories of them, even though they're they're gone, but this. You know, or is it, are you perfectly washed clean, even the scars? You know, it seems to me if you take away the wrinkles and the stains, you'll leave some sort of residue or, or a scar or something like that. And, and Jesus had scars to remind us of what he went through. Yeah, the whole idea is that no matter the scars resulting from the spots and the wrinkles, if we would submit, here's the word, if we would submit, ourselves individually as member of his body to him as our leader to him as our beginning to him as our origin if we stay close with jesus and his word the eventual result will be we will be holy we will be blameless we will be found by him in all our glory not just some all so we can safely assume no matter how deep the scar is somehow some way he's gonna make it invisible i mean i only say that as a scar as a reminder where we came from it's not where we are now yeah when we unpack these two word spots and wrinkles right and then you couple that with the word holy and blameless verse 27 and then you in, insert into the transitioning the transformation spots wrinkles to holy and blameless with two other words, water and the word, water and the word. Just look at it like this. Uh, I remember when we visited you, Stephen, at the end of the visit, you were thinking about power washing your fence, right? Yeah. yeah. So what happens? What happens when you power wash your fence? Do you think the stains and the marks on that fence would remain? No, but the divots will. That's yes, but I know what you're saying, brother. Yeah, right? And that's the point. And, and, and when we get there, there's a first from Ezekiel, by the way. This is nothing is coincidental here, Bill. <laughs> there are two verses from Ezekiel that's going to help us to understand this phrase, washing with the water of his word. Right? So, so far, so good? Well, I just got to clarify to Chris, it wasn't power washing. Somebody mentioned using pool chlorine in water and just sprayed it on with that. So, it wasn't power washing, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you got the big idea, right? Okay. <laughs> so, verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husband. Here's the phrase. In everything in everything the whole idea is if a wife does not subject uh, if you process the word subject from the, the greek hupotasso submit hupotasso right there right the, the idea here is whenever a wife does not completely subject or submit to the christian husband she's leaving the door wide open 
says, leaving the door wide open for the enemy of the church, for the enemy of the body of Christ to do a damage, to leave a mark, to leave a spot, and it causes wrinkles in the process on herself. By the way, there were subject submit in the Greek, hupotasso. In the Hebrew, it actually means to serve out of love. To serve out of love. So it's not a reluctant serving. It's not a, an obligated serving. Avad. Avad. Uh, it's a serving that is based on her love for her husband. Put it this way. See, he doesn't have to ask her to serve. She will automatically serve based on the fact that her husband is loving her the way Christ loves the church. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, it says right here, in everything. That's very important because sometimes our flesh would want to get in the way. I'm speaking for the both of us right here, the husbands and the wives, right? You come home from work. You had a rough day at work. You walk into the door for whatever unknown reason. Your flesh just want to get the best out of you. It is in those moments we need to remind ourselves right here for the wife in everything, for the husband, just as Christ loves the church. That's the qualifying phrase, just as Christ loves the church. So far, so good. Any question? So to submit, to subject for the wives right here, Hupotasso is a military term in the sense that when a commanding officer commands the cadets to line up for the morning uh, discipline, for the morning, whatever you want to call it, check. Right? Inspection. Yeah, inspection. If you look from the site, let's say that you have 50 cadets being commanded to line up, you're going to see them lining up one next to the other perfectly in the position that they've been taught and trained. That's the idea of submission, to come alongside, not in front, not behind, alongside the husband. That's the idea with this word hupotasso. But as I said, in the Hebrew, it has the idea of serving out of love. Let's go to Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, verse 16. This, uh, how many of you have read the book of Hosea? Yes. A very interesting book, isn't it? Imagine you called by God to be a prophet to marry a prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> that one I have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a beautiful story, though. <laughs> yes. There's a whole lot of theology of love in that book. Uh, that's why I'm using Hosea chapter 2, verse 16. There are two words in this verse in the original Hebrew that caught my attention, uh, so to speak, that is applicable when it comes to us interpreting this word submit and subject. Hosea 2, 16. Whoever has it, feel free. I'll read it. Therefore, I will allure her now, and I will lead her into the wilderness and speak persuasively to her. Okay. And then is there something else what it says? In that day, declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. Oh, yeah, that's 18. Sorry, I stopped. 18. I only read 16. I'm sorry. That's my fault. 18, right? So yes. if you, even if you process verse 18 in light of verse 16, it becomes more evident in the sense that these two words that we want to zoom in, number one, my husband, my husband. The idea right there, Isi, Isi, is a loving husband. It's a loving husband. The contrast between this phrase, my husband and my master, simply is in the Hebrew word translated as my master is Ba'ali, Ba'ali. Guess what other word is included in the word Ba'ali? See, Paul, my, 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 um, NASB 2020 has my Bayal. 
Exactly. Yeah, my Bayal. Who is Bayal? Uh, a bad idol. <laughs> yes, that's why it pays for us to pay attention when we read the Bible, right? Because why NSSB leaves it the way that it is? Because some Hebrew words do not have the equivalent English word to translate into. In this case, what God is trying to show uh, Hosea and you and I right here, when it comes to the context of a marriage, remember the main thought, the main idea of Hosea, he called Hosea to be a prophet. Here's the twist. I want you to marry that prostitute. Why? Because God is teaching Hosea a powerful lesson right here. If you could love that prostitute, you will know how much I love you. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Isn't and, and also in turn, that kind of love to the prostitute will turn her from her ways and love him. Right? Yeah. It's a beautiful contrast of changing the prostitute into somebody worthy of being loved by God. Yes. The whole idea here, this word Baal and this word Baali, my master, husbands, be careful. God never intends you and I as husband to be this Baali, master to our wives, to the point where people worship Baal. Mm -hmm. One word, powerful application, Baali, my master. What God intends for you and I, husband, in the context of our marriage is to be E.C., loving husband. And notice in that verses 16, 17, and 18, if you read the whole book of Hosea, Hosea tried to buy his prostitute wife back, but she refused. So in verse 16 that Mary Alice was reading to us, that is a depiction of God loving you and I, and yet you and I are like a prostitute moving away, <laughs> running away from God, yet God pursue you and I the way he want Hosea to pursue his wife, the prostitute, even into the wilderness. You get it right there? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, moving on. Now, the mandate to the husband. Husband, are you ready? <laughs> husband. Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In this verse alone, there are two practical ways for husband to love their wives. Number one, as Christ also loved the church. How? Giving himself up for the church. Right there. Giving himself up for the church. You and I, as Christian husband, must be trustworthy, must be found trustworthy by our wives, just as the church finds Christ to be trustworthy. Why and how so? Because Christ's love for the bride, his bride, the church, you and I, is such that he gave himself up completely, even to the point of dying for her even to the point of dying for her. As I said before, right, this word head, kephale, source, beginning, and then this word savior, it, it has the idea soter, soter, Greek word soter, has the idea of protecting, delivering, saving, preserving. See, if we just ask ourselves this question on a daily basis, husbands, do we protect our wives on a daily basis, particularly spiritual protection? Mm. Mm. Do we deliver our wives from spiritual danger? Do we preserve, do we preserve our wives spiritually all the time? Do we save our wives spiritually all the time? Yeah. One word to save. Savior, soteriology, soter, to say, right? So, 26, why? Why did Christ give himself up for the bride, for his bride, for the church? So that he might sanctify her. So that he might sanctify her. 
how how does Christ sanctify the church, you and I? Cleansing you and I by the washing of water with the word. Now, uh, I'm going to put Mary Alice on the spot here, Mary Alice, if you don't okay. mind. So when we visited you, we were grateful. You showed us the wedding album pictures, right? So is this not true? As with any culture, the bride will prepare herself such that the shower is the number one most important thing prior to that very important day of getting married. So uh, if that's the case with a bride preparing herself to appear the most beautiful, to appear the most desirable to her husband on that wedding day, just imagine what Christ, the groom to the church you and I would do with the washing of our stains, our sins, our spots, our wrinkles, with the water, with his word. This is a tricky, very tricky statement. By the washing of water with the word. So I'm using the example of Mary Alice's uh, wedding, marriage to Frank, when it comes to the bride, the bride shower. But if we go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, you, don't, you don't have to read them. I'm going to summarize it. Ezekiel chapter 16, the first 13 verses, the first 13 verses. Israel, you know what? Let's read it. There's something in there. There's something in there that would, that would bless all of us. That will help us to understand this phrase in verse 26, the washing of water with the word. Ezekiel chapter 16, the first 13 verses. 16? Yep. I can read it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, This is what the Lord God says to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. No, I looked with pity on you and do any of these things for you to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field for you were abhorred on the day you were born. When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. Yes, I said, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. I made you very numerous like plants of the fields. When you grew up, became tall and reached the age of fine jewelry, your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God." Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with colorful woven cloth and put sandals of fine leather on your feet. And I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I, I adorned you with jewelry, put bracelets on your wrists and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk, and colorful woven cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil, so you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. There you go. If you were to summarize those 13 verses, simply, God found Israel Figuratively speaking, as an abandoned girl, dirty, bloody, right? And notice in the 13 verses twice, the word was was used. God picked that abandoned baby girl, dirty, bloody, smelly, and he washes her twice. That's the whole idea. And that becomes even more clear if you go to... Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. 
chapter 36, verse 25, enhances the idea of cleansing with water. It gives us a better understanding of why Paul penned on in verse 26, Christ sanctify you and I, cleansing you and I by the washing of water with the word. Ezekiel 36, 25. Uh, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. That is the genesis of the start of baptism. That is the genesis of the idea of baptisms. I will sprinkle you. See? Systematic theology. That's what we're doing right here. Whatever theology you find in the New Testament must harmonize with the theology we find in the Old Testament and vice versa. So in those quotations from Ezekiel, right, chapter 16 and 36, with the word washing with water being used twice in chapter 16 and sprinkling with water, that is what Paul had in his mind when he penned down this verse 26. Understand one thing. He has been given this masterion, mystery, called the body, the ecclesia. Do you know what is the number one difference when it comes to being admitted to the body of Christ in the New Testament compared to being admitted into the covenant that got cut with Abraham in the Old Testament? What was the number one requirement for you and I, if we live at the time of Abraham, to enter into the covenant that got made with Abraham? What were we expected to do? Circumcision. Circumcision. Yeah. Circumcision. But can circumcision be applied to women? No. No. Now, moving into the New Testament, you see the progression of this theology from circumcision to males only into baptism that includes males and females. Is this making sense? So, uh, application, verse 26. Do we husbands wash the stains, the contamination that are on our wives on a daily basis with the word of God? Hmm. Because if we don't, can we honestly say that we have done what Paul is telling us right here, loving our wife as Christ loves the church, giving up himself for the church, sanctifying the church, separating the first. This was sanctifying simply this, right? Those of you who have children or grandchildren, Right, if you attended their soccer game, volleyball, and what have you, sometimes when the, the, the game ended, they, they got into the car dirty and smelly and wet. Right? So are you gonna allow them to come into the house that way? Mm. No. Mm. No. Same principle when it when it comes to the husband and his wife, right? Spiritually speaking, what? is it more powerful, Stephen? We, I, you asked if we were bathing our wives in the in the Word, and I, I guess my first reaction was, well, I guess I'm not in the Bible every day, but then I would say the Living Word, the the the, the Scripture that lives inside of me. I'm definitely catering to my wife because of the Living Word inside of me. You know, I, you know, I don't always get it right, but for sure, she's getting, she's getting. The, the byproduct of what those words were put into my spirit, though. Well, I'm going to give a good example of how to wash a wife with the word, okay? Say you come home from work, things happen, you and your wife got into a heated argument, bad words were being exchanged. Stop saying bad words. Take uh -huh. a few steps back and counter those bad words that you hear from her with good words from the Bible. That's not Solomon right? And you can read this in the Proverbs. Looking back after the fact, he penned on Proverbs for you and I to apply. Never is a win-win situation. 
when a wife is saying something to the husband, perhaps not intentionally, even if she's doing it intentionally, the responsibility of the husband is to wash that stain from those bad words that he's hearing coming out of his wife's mouth with words that are soothing, with words that are the exact opposite of those bad words. Okay, so I, right, so that's a work in progress, which in, coincidentally is going on in my life right now. But you say that at one point God's going to or Jesus is going to present us to the Father as as white. But then in the in the next verse, I hear this is a, this is a school that we never graduate from. So how is He really going to present us? You know, the, the way we are. Or, or is, I mean, is there going to come a place in time when all of that stops? Well, it goes back to this word submission. It goes back to verse 21, Stephen. Just as husbands expect their wife to submit to Christ, the wives have the rights to expect their husband to submit to Christ because verse 21 said, submit one to another in the reference of Christ. See, Salvation is a partnership. Sanctification is a partnership. If you go to a church, if you listen to a teaching that says that God will do it all for you, my advice for you would be get out of that place. No, I kind of get it. You know, if, if I walk and say we're going into a wedding and she's looking as beautiful, let's say Thomas's wedding, she's just looking as beautiful as I could ever saw her. And I'm standing next to her, and I just know that the love right there is is there, and I don't see an imperfection at that moment. So I guess I kind of get it. When 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 God when Christ stands next to this bride, He only sees that beauty and that beautiful gown or whatever. See, here is here is part of this misinterpretation of this passage. They interpret this passage apart from verse twenty one. What I mean by that is. Some Bible teacher, Bible preacher are quick to come to the husband's side to demand the wives to submit to their husband, but they fail to process this in light of verse 21. I've always said to correctly interpret a verse, a narrative, a passage, you must take into account the preceding and the proceeding verses. If you were to interpret these verses apart from 21, you're going to misinterpret, you're going to misapply. This is why a lot of husbands, without them realizing it, they come into a marriage having been taught this passage at the exclusion of verse 21. From day one of their marriage, they expect their wives to submit to them, but they never submit to Christ themselves. Look at it like this. In that example that I just used, your submission to Christ will be to bite your tongue. Your submission to Christ will be to step back. Your submission to Christ will be, I'm sorry. Until and unless we get to that point, husbands, we have no rights to demand submission from our wives. <laughs> is it easy? No, because our flesh will always want to be in control. This is how you know. This is why Paul used this word in verse 26, sanctify. What does that mean? You got to cooperate with his Holy Spirit. You got to say in those heated moments, when the rubber meets the road, you got to bite your tongue. You got to bow your head. You got to say, help me. Because if you don't, I'm going to blow it again. The men are under the gun in this teaching. If you go to a church that elevates the men when they teach this, get out of that church, please. <laughs> because that's not, what, that's not what Paul is teaching. Look, we got to take into account the historical and the cultural context. During his days, men were considered to have more authority and power over women. That truth, that facts of life alone, 
is putting the women in such a very bad situation. In this teaching, when we are done unpacking this, Paul is actually elevating the wives by challenging the husband to come down to the levels of the wives. Mm-hmm. Notice the brilliance of this apostle in this teaching. His mandate begins to be directed to the wives. You and I, all right, let's be honest right here. Man, can I ask you a question? When you read this passage and you begin reading verse 22, whether the first time or the tenth time, apart from tonight's teaching, is this not true? The moment you read 22, there's something on the inside of you saying, yeah, I'm going to get him. <laughs> I was just going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, right. No, right. I, I agree. I, no, I've been too, through too many marriage ministries and studied these Ephesian <laughs> things too many times. I I know it I know it's 50-50. See, but this is why I always hammer it into your mind and your heart to correctly interpret at first a narrative, a passage. You must take into account the preceding and the proceeding. If you look at chapter 6, verse 1, it's the same principle. Children, obey your parents. Children, submit to your parents. Children, honor your parents. 21, be in subjection one to another. So 21 is a bookend on one side, 6 1 is a bookend on the other. And in between, he's giving us this teaching in application how to submit one to another in the context of a marriage. Why? Because Paul later on is going to tell us at the end of this teaching, you're going to notice a sudden shift in his thinking. By the way, I'm not really talking about marriage between a husband and his wife, I'm talking about the marriage between Christ and his wife. Right, right, May I ask? If it if it makes the men feel any better, women <laughs> have been like this is used. I for my friends that are not Christian, this is the reason that they will point to as wives that they're not Christian because it says my the God didn't care about women and my husband can rule over me and do anything he wants and so. It, it's it's a fallacy for women too that you know we were raised to believe that God didn't care about us we were second class citizens so yeah that's exactly what caused Paul to give this teaching because of the historical and cultural context of his day remember we're talking about a city called Ephesus we're talking about a city where the worship of Artemis is just about everywhere you turn your head. We're talking about women being used in the worship of Artemis as prostitutes. Stephen. Yeah. So, but in a male sense, is there is there a part that that is, is that, that the husband is supposed to be the buck stops here kind of thing, the representative of the family, not to be the the leader so much, the representative. And uh, and uh, what was I where there was a second part of that going? Uh, husband's like. Um, I don't know. Um, just some, I don't know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Actually, so far, all these verses we've unpacked, right? There is nothing here that alludes to leadership for the man, for the husband. There is nothing here that Paul is writing down and penning down and teaching to you and I right here that is spotlighting the husband to be the leader. As okay, a matter of so that- so yeah. that being said, I back up to what you said that it's going to be the man, the husband's responsibility to choke down and stop that argument from taking root. You know, I, I was just curious on that. It, it is my responsibility to stop that in its tracks as much as it, it, it hurts to choke it down then. In that way, the, you lead your wife away. You lead your wife away from the deterioration of their marriage. If you were to stop more wood into their fire, that's what it means right here in verse 25. Love your wife as Christ loves the church. Gave himself up. Think about it like this, right? Before you and I have any knowledge of the Bible at all, as Christian, 
when we enter into the marriage covenant? Is this not true? When an argument arises, we always want to have the last words. Yeah. yeah. Is that leading by example? No. no. Here's a secret. Sometimes it is better to lose a battle with your wife and win the war than the other way around. I know it was always me versus her instead of like looking at it like us moving towards him. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. you know we're, we're in unison to to walk towards Christ every day. And and you know I I she's my ex but I still call her my wife and I I know God I don't know. I but I spent all day with her yesterday and um it was a beautiful day. And oh boy sometimes I do look at her and like if she only knew what I know now. You know if 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 only God has it. Don't get me wrong. But, um, yeah, I was that had to win. The bear came out when I, I had to, like, have the last word. And she knew I knew I could put fear in her, which is terrible to even say. But, um, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, I was going to say, Chris, uh, you know, we a lot of us have been down this road with previous marriages, you know, and. I thank God every day that I met my wife because uh, I wasn't in the word and, you know, who, who knows, it would have made uh, a big difference uh, back then if we just had some sort of guidance and this mandate to, to go by. And, uh, right. you know, it's, it's water over the dam, but uh, you know, on the other hand, I'm thankful for where I'm at now, but um, I don't know how God looks at this, you know, and again, there's a lot of us that are in this boat. So how does God judge on this? Because we were a failure and a train wreck back then. Well, God is the redeeming God. <laughs> well, we have failed him in the past or one another ourselves is going to give us another chance, right? The Bible is very clear. He'll extend his mercy to the thousands of generations. If he would do that to the generations, how much more he would do that individually, right? The key mm -hmm. is don't live in the past. The past is the past. Move forward. Learn from it. Amen. Move forward. Don't get stuck in the past, right? And with each and every redeeming opportunity that you cooperated with God, it's going to get smoother. It's going to get easier, right? So verse 27, he says, he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So this word wrinkle has the idea of a compromise, a disobedience in certain areas of our lives. So this is a willful, willful disobedience. This is a willful compromise look at it like this for the women for the wives if they don't take care of their skin what's going to happen to their skin this is why wrinkle has the connotation that we cause it ourselves because we've been careless and the Greek word tells us right here, ritida, ritida tells us right here, we've compromised a certain areas of our life. We've compromised a certain aspect of our life, whether our mind, whether our mouth, whether our heart, whether a habit, whether a lifestyle, right? On the other hand, spot right here has the idea of a defect, has, has the idea of a defect in the sense that uh, th this is attitude, this is mentality, this is perception, that we keep, and because of that, it keeps us away further from God. It keeps us away further from God. Now, if you want to put it in a practical way, these two words, spots and wrinkle, spot is something that we are born with. Wrinkle is something that we cause ourselves. Mm. That's, that's the easiest way. I can explain it to all of us here. So what is Paul trying to tell us right here? 
remember that Ezekiel chapter 16 from verse 1 to verse 13. Remember God describing this, this, this girl born with the defects. That's her spots. You and I have spots. Every one of us has more than, some of us has hundreds of spots. But the idea is if you and I was to submit one to another in the context of a marriage, in reference to Christ as our head, as our origin, as our source, if you want to put it that way, he'll make sure every single spot will be washed clean, mm. undetectable. This is why later on it says right here, holy and blameless, holy and blameless. This word holy means unique, one of a kind. There is no second one. Unique, one of a kind, separated. And this, this word blameless right here, blemish, blemish, amomos, amomos, has the idea of guilt, has the idea of fault, has the idea of unrepentant, unrepentant sin. Mm. Sin does that to us, whether we realize it or not. Every sin we commit, there is consequence. If that consequence of sin is not washed away, it's not cleansed, it's going to turn into a blemish. Mm. Then we become blameful. Instead mm. of blameless, we become blameful. Now, of all the relationship we have, the relationship between a husband and his wife, a wife to her husband, is that very relationship where a lot of these spots and wrinkles are not being seen and observed by others. You follow what I'm saying? Why? Because we live with our spouse 724 under the same roof. I may look good to you on Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday morning, but aside from that, you probably don't see the spots and the wrinkles on me but my wife does. That's the point of Paul giving us this teaching. If we cannot do that in the context of two human beings under the same roof, 724, how are we were gonna expand that to others? Hmm. Frank? Paul, well, does this tie into the leprosy that Miriam had had uh, with Moses and they sent her off because of the uh behavior demons that she had in her yeah so the story goes <laughs> that miriam was complaining about moses marrying a kusite woman right but if you dig in that story the reason she had the leprosy was not because he was against moses marrying a kusite woman she was jealous of the power and authority that god gave to moses now, if you process that from a Hebraic mindset, God did not cause Miriam to have that leprosy. When God's presence left her, the stress that she put herself under because of that jealousy was what caused that leprosy. Leprosy in that particular story right there is like a psoriasis, psoriasis. You can Google this out. Stress can cause psoriasis mm -hmm. yeah let alone, yeah let alone emotional stress yep. see miriam put herself under that emotional duress and stress because of her jealousy this is why i always say nine out of ten cases there is a spiritual root cause to an illness we just have to dig into it mm -hmm. right thank you bill you're welcome bill yeah, Paul, I've uh when it talks about husband sanctifying the wife, I know I have I have a handful of friends who it, it seems like the wife is husband. The wife is the spiritual leader, the wife is holding it together. You know, I have a really good friend and I was just talking to him this afternoon. He's I don't know what a deacon even is, but he's a deacon of a church. But the wife is definitely the spiritual leader. It's Chris. And, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm just think I know it's a rabbit trail, but I just know a lot of a handful of Christian men whose wives are 
the, the rock, the foundation, the spiritual leaders of the home. And they're, you know, they're like the glue of the marriage and the man is not, there's just no equal, you know, he's just not up there being the role of the man. How would you describe a relationship like that? It's just because I keep hearing husbands, 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 but I just know a lot of people, including my neighbor, it's the wives. It's definitely yeah. the wives as the spiritual, I mean, hands down, walking yeah. in unison with Christ. Great question, right? So if we just go back to first 21 right here, when a wife is the spiritual leader over her husband in the marriage, is he subjecting herself to the husband? No. Is that not then a violation of first 21? And it's still the man's problem then. It still falls with the man. Well, it's both. Well, it, it, it's both in the sense that according to first 21, they are to subject one to another in the reference, in the reference of Christ. If you want to go back to Genesis, how God created Adam, he created Adam first, then he took a sight of Adam, and then he created Eve, and then he brought Eve to Adam. So because of that, Eve, the wife, is intended by God to complete the husband. Whether it's in the situation that you're sharing right there, the wife is leading the husband. How is that going to fit into that creation narrative? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I didn't quite mean leading in that sense. Leading in the way of the example of her relationship with Christ, with God. Leading in that aspect, not trying to lead the family, but where the husband is maybe lagging spiritually, he's picked it up. In that Double. case. I mean, that, yeah, you know. Right. In that case. the rules up to the man, but by no means straying from the path of God, no matter what the man's actions are. Yeah, as long as she's leading her husband to Christ through her leading her husband. Because the whole idea is eventually, once she led her husband to Christ through her leading her husband spiritually, then the husband will take over. Right. Right? Because remember, Adam said to Eve, when God brought Eve to Adam, this is bone of my bones, Flesh of my flesh. But notice who is making that statement. Adam making yeah. that statement to Eve, not the other way around. Adam is acknowledging, without her, I'm incomplete. Right. right. But it's commendable for the wife to fill into that role temporarily until the husband sees the truth that he's been created and called by God to be following the footstep of Jesus Christ as the head of the church. Again, it says right here, right? Be subject to your own husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, right there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Alice? So I think, Paul, um, when you were here, we talked about this with you, but one of the things as this relates to with Frank and I, I wake up early in the morning and I do my reading and my quiet time and all of that stuff. And so the poor guy, when he wakes up, I am just ready to like, I am so on fire for all of the things that I learned that I want to talk to him about, that I want to bounce around with him and all of that. And so, you know, if for in our house, it's just a timing thing. It's a, because I wake up early, he right. does all of his stuff. And then comes around where we can, you know, he can lead us spiritually and we can pray and do those things. But the timing for us is just that I'm up in the morning. So I'm like, go, 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 go. And when he gets up and hasn't even had his coffee yet, I'm just ready to go. Oh, can I tell you about this? This is what I read. Let's talk about this. Where do you see this and all of that? So, and I don't even need coffee to do that. So, um, so, you know, if somebody were looking in from the outside, they may think that that's unbalanced in terms of, am I trying to lead him? But I will say it's just a timing thing and more of a personality thing. But I am aware through the studies that we've been doing that I need to kind of 
tamper down and be careful that I don't try to overrun him because this is not a coup. Yeah, it's just a matter of you two sitting down, talking about it, coming with some kind of an agreement, okay? Give me half an hour. Let's say Frank says to you, okay, sweetie, give me half an hour after I have my first cup of coffee. That's all, right? There will be a practical solution to that. But if you two never talk about it, this is going to brew on the inside. Right. Sean? I just wanted to say, Mary Alice, we know you're the boss. <laughs> tolerance to it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Chris, what am I? <laughs> the, the priestess. <laughs> the priestess. <laughs> the priestess. Uh, Sean, don't thanks don't... for speaking up. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, verse uh, 28. So, husband ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. The idea right here is Eve was created out of a sight of Adam. So if Adam was to love Eve as he loves himself, that is expected. Just look at it like this. For those of us who have children, right? Even after they turn 18, go on their own way, even if they disobey and dishonor you and I, right? They're still a part of your flesh, aren't they? Right? Mm -hmm. This is what Paul is saying right here. If you would love your wife the way God created Eve out of Adam, taking a part of him to create Eve, you are expected to love your wife as you love your body, as you love yourself. If you don't do that, something is wrong with you. Mm. That's what Paul is trying to say right here. I think it's very logical. Yeah. And as I said, if you just apply this truth with our children, it doesn't matter if they disobey you, dishonor you after they turn 18 and you know, give you a hard time, they're still your flesh and blood. Right? And Paul is going to repeat that. Paul is going to repeat that. So, it says in verse 21 right here, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Right there, he's giving us the reason why we as husband must love our wife as we love our own body, because they are a part of us. Why? Because according to the creation of Adam and Eve, Eve was taken, created out of a part of Adam, so our wives are also a part of us. Whether we want to believe it or not, Spiritually speaking, based on the creation of Adam and Eve, that is the truth. This is why if you go back to the creation of Adam and Eve, right? Eve is to be a help me to Adam. Eve is to be a help me to Adam. And did you not notice what's the first thing that happened to Eve after Adam pronounced her to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? Guess who came in between the two of them? Say it. Say it. Now, we're getting somewhere here because Paul is trying to teach you and I as husbands and wives, be united. Do everything you can not to be divided. And in this teaching, Paul is telling the husband, come down to your wife's level and he's giving the wife the opportunity to come up to the husband's level so that there will be a meeting halfway, tongue and groove, spiritually speaking, so that they will be united. So Paul is telling you and I right here so far, husband, always, always, always perceive your wife as part of your own body. And he says in verse 29 right here, nobody will intentionally, willfully, voluntarily starve their own body to death. But they will nourish and cherish. If you look at the word nourish and cherish right there, it's very clear. The word nourish is to fatten from, to fatten from. What does that mean? Well, if you don't eat willfully, intentionally, voluntarily, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to lose weight. You're going to get sick. 
you're going to die. But if you nourish your body on a daily basis, you're going to get fat. That's what it means, I did to nourish. The word to cherish, on the other hand, is to foster, to brood, to foster. You got to foster, you got to brood your body, right? Every one of us has a different habit. You know, I know Bill, Bill likes steak, for example. That's okay, but that's how he nourishes and cherishes his body. Somebody else like shrimp, somebody else like chicken. Paul is saying right here, who intentionally, willfully, and voluntarily starves his body or does damage to his body? And if you won't do that to your own body, what gives you the permission to do that to your wives? Right? Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to tell us the motives. Because, he says, we are members of his body. Because husbands and wives are members of Christ's body. Because husband and wives are members of the body of Christ. He's not just talking about the body being the church. He's going back to the creation of Adam and Eve. Who is the source of life for Adam and Eve? God. 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 Now, let's ask ourselves this question. Today, just today alone, for those of us who are married, right? Did you ever see your wife as belonging to the same God that you do? D did you ever see your wife as being a part and parcel of yourself? Did you see your wife as coming from the same source that you do? This is what he's trying to tell us right here. We are members of his body. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. That's good. Can I tell you something? Yeah. For those of us who are married, when, when the husband and the wife die, all that you're going to see when we get up there is no longer, oh, that's my husband. Oh, that's my wife. No, Jesus' yeah. teaching is very clear. <laughs> that does not apply in heaven. Marriage is designed by God just for this life on this earth. Why? So that the manifold wisdom of God can be made manifest to the church. Remember, we talk about this in chapter 2 and chapter 3. The reason God gave Paul this mystery of the church, God intends for his manifold wisdom to be manifested to the church. How? To the gifts that he's going to give to the body. Okay? But here is the problem with a lot of married couples especially if they've been married for a long time and there have been a lot of issues that are not resolved, they begin to see one another as enemy. Am I right? Paul wants the husband and wife to see themselves as completing one another, completing one another, not competing against one another. This is why he said, because we are members of one body. And then he gives us the biblical reason going back to Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That word join, right, that means to be glued. What happens when you glue two things together with super glue? Stick. Stick. They don't come yep. apart very easy. You're not going to be able to be broken up. You're not going to be able to be broken up. But this word leave right here is very important. Do you know some friends of yours who are in a marriage covenant where the husband is still mama's boy, where the wife is still daddy's girl? And guess what happens to that marriage? Yeah. This is the word leave right here. You must intentionally, willfully, voluntarily, when you set your eyes on that man, when you set your eyes on that woman, you must voluntarily, willfully, intentionally sever that relationship with your mother and your father. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to be glued to your spouse. This is very important because if you don't, if you're not glued to your spouse, guess what? There is a gap. And guess who's going to stand in the gap? 
Satan. The devil, Satan, is going to make sure that gap is going to get wider. Frank. Well, why did you say the all capital letters again in the New Testament? Does that reflect from the Old Testament, the mandate? No, uh, whenever you see in NASB all capital letters, that's a direct quotation. Okay. So this verse 31, Paul simply just directly quoted from Genesis 2, I think it's 23, somewhere right there, 24. So uh, every English translation uh, at the beginning a few pages, they explain to you why the translation are that way. In the case of NASB, which is the one I'm using, Whenever you see all capital letters, that's a direct quotation. Paul basically just took that first and put it in his teaching. Okay. And there's wisdom in that. Because Paul wants us to see this unity, the basis of this unity that he's been teaching right here. It's because Eve was created out of Adam. And Adam was created by God. So if Adam was created by God and Eve was created by from Adam, that means Eve also is created by God. Right? Pretty simple logic, I think. But a lot of us fail to put that into practice, especially if you marry somebody of different culture, different ethnicity, different lifestyle. This is why Paul warns us, do not be unequally yoked. Because that's a gap. And the devil would love to stand in the gap and keep pushing the two walls away and away and away. When God intends for the wall to be joined, glued together, right? So we have the motive right there coming to verse 32. Now he's telling us what he's actually doing right here. This mystery is great. He's still talking about husband and wife. But notice the shift. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Now you know, based on this verse 32, Paul was simply using the context of marriage to teach you and I the unity of Christ and his body. The unity of Christ being the head of the church, the church being his body. Where there is no unity, the church will never succeed. This is a church. Christ is the head of this church. Where each and every one of us goes different way, this Bible study will go down the drain. Now, I'm going to bring it home to myself. I'm just a mouthpiece. If I go this direction, when Christ wants me to go that direction, this Bible study will not succeed. Unity, unity, unity. That's what he's hammering right here. And we need to understand this. He used this word mystery, masterion, mystery, masterion. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, Adam said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Can we say that every day to our wife? Despite the fact that sometimes yeah. he got up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> or we got up on the wrong side of the bed. Or and, never gets out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> and we must, in those moments when the rubber meets the road, it's all the more. We must remember. We must remember. Our marriage is to be a reflection of the future wedding of Christ and the church. Yeah. Yesterday, I shared a little bit about the Jewish wedding. If you ever attended a Jewish wedding, right, the men will be grouped in one group, the women will be grouped in another group, and then there will be two chairs, and then during the dancing and the celebration and what have you, they're going to put the bride on one chair, the groom on another chair, they're going to lift them up, they're going to continue to dance separately. Somewhere among those times of dancing, they're going to allow the bride and the groom to get connected. They're going to exchange something, a handkerchief or what have you. What is the idea? See, consummation of a marriage should not take place until the marriage is official, right? Consummation of the marriage should not take place until the marriage is official. That couple 
the bride and the, the groom being given the opportunity to exchange their handkerchief in the example that I use is God through Paul's teaching, especially in the context of this marriage, is giving you an idea to start. From the get-go, God has a, an Eve for you, the Adam. From the get-go, God has an Adam for you, the Eve. Now, if you would follow this teaching and apply this teaching, even before the consummation of their marriage, he's going to give you the opportunity to be glued, to be united, so that when you enter into their marriage officially, the road will be even smoother. The exchange of the handkerchief is a token. From now on, a part of you will become me, a part of me will become you. And in some cases, they will tie the handkerchief. The idea is unity, union, unbreakable. Okay? So far, so good. Now, verse 33, the memorandum. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must also see to it that she respects her husband. So Paul goes back to the creation of Adam and Eve. Remember, he's telling the husbands here, your wife has been created by God out of a part of you. The best way to keep the marriage going is for you to love your wife as you love your own body because she is part of your body anyway, and you are expected to love your wife as you love your body. It is when you don't do that, something, something terrible is gonna happen. But if you do that, your wife will automatically serve you out of you loving her, out of you loving her as your own body. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Did you notice in this teaching, now once Paul is commanding the husband to die on the cross for the wife. Did you notice in this teaching, now once the word leading, leader, leadership is used by Paul in addressing the husband. Unity, unity is the topic. Unity is the thought here. So Paul, given the culture of his day, when it comes to the man, uh, having more power and authority during his days, and the wives and the women being treated as second-class citizens, he's challenging the husband right here to behave like Christ when it comes to Christ's relationship with his church, his body. And at the same time, he's giving the wives the opportunity to rise up. This is not about gender role. This is not about who controls who. This is about equality from the perspective that Eve has been created out of a part of Adam. Just as the church is the body and Christ is the head. These two, when it's separated, it's no good. But when they are not, it's powerful. Just think of the husband and the wives here. When we are on the same page, we are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. The devil fears couple who are on the same page. The devil flees when he faces a couple that he cannot persuade one against another. When the couple, when the couple is, if you take just a piece of paper, right? This is the husband, this is the wife. If the husband and wife is like a piece of paper, do you really think the devil can come in between the two sides of this paper? No. It's impossible. The only way he can do that is. But the problem with a lot of marriages, the husband is one piece of paper, the wife is another piece of paper, and there's a distance. Paul said, keep unity at all costs, even if you have to bite your tongue, even if you have to die to yourself, even if you have to say, I'm sorry. 10 times a day. That's what it means to submit. That's what it means to walk worthily in a marriage context. 
And when we do that, Paul is saying, the people around us who are not Christian, they're going to be drawn to that unity. They're going to wonder, why is it there's something different about you guys? What is it about you that's different? That's an opportunity for you to give your testimony. I once was this, I once was that, but now I'm this. You follow what I'm saying? What is the mystery Paul is trying to tell you and I? Christ so longs to be our head. But it is we that refuses to be his body. We want to do it our way. We want to go our own direction. We want to be autonomous. The sin of Adam and Eve simply is this. They wanted to be independent of God. This is why the devil came and convinced Eve. If you eat that fruit, you're going to be what you ought to be. But Eve didn't realize she's already what God wanted her to be. Right? Is this making sense? Yes. My, my, my study Bible has an explanation that's really cool, too. It says when your tires are out of alignment and your tires wear out, getting new tires isn't going to fix the problem. You need an alignment and be, staying aligned with God in unison with God in alignment with God will fix the true problem, the root of the spiritual problem. Yes, yes. And the alignment is going back to the word of God. The alignment is seeking the truth in the word of God. Why is this thing keep happening? What did I do wrong? What did I not do? What did I say? Right? And if I can leave you guys with one, one uh, truth, when it comes to husband and wife, it never is about who is wrong. It never is about who is right either. Mm. It's always about what is right. And what is right must be based on the Bible. When the flesh on the inside of us is trying to rear its ugly head, sometimes the solution to that is as simple as walking away. Take a long, deep breath. Shut your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's dying to yourself. Yeah. That's leading by example. Instead of keep throwing more wood into the fire that's already burning higher by and higher by the minute. <laughs> the tongue has the power of life and death. Yes. 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 And, and, and that's the truth, though. That's the truth. When, when you got into an argument and that flesh is boiling on the inside of you, unless you're a very disciplined person, even if you are a very disciplined person, it behooves you to return evil with good. It behooves you to counter every bad word with edifying words. Did you ever notice something? When, if you're in a heat of a moment in disagreement, if you would muster up enough courage, if you would humble yourself, just say, I'm sorry everything will drop. You're going to hear, you're going to hear the pin drop. You, you could almost hear the pin drop. But if you keep going like this, <laughs> you fall on and say, it's not worth it. Battling that pride. Yeah. Yes. That stubbornness, that pride, that here's, here's the keyword. Self-righteousness. I'm always right. You're always wrong. I have to have the last say. Paul here is saying, husband, come down from your high horse, will you? <laughs> and yeah. let your wife get on the same horse so you two can go right. riding the horse together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn a few more things about ourselves in the context of marriage. Help us to repent of our tendency to want to have the last word, to want to portray ourselves as the leader not even knowing how to lead. Help us from this point on to see our wife 
as a part of us. And loving our wife as we love our body, nourishing her, cherishing her, and with the help of you, Holy Spirit, washing any spot and wrinkle on her with the truth from your word. Direct us, guide us, lead us, correct us, convict us where we have failed, we've missed it in the past. Help us not to repeat those mistakes again. Grace us to focus on the unity of the marriage as a reflection of the unity between Christ the head and the church, his body. We ask this in the name of him who through his life made this possible to the glory, honor, and praise of the Father who created us in his own image and likeness. Through your inspiration, Holy Spirit, we ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.